Thanks, everyone. I just really wanted to be in New York. I want to say, like, in San Francisco, we don't have, like, incubators like this. Uh, Kevin, you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, an incubator like this in San Francisco is an empty warehouse with pizza rat. You don't, you don't get this fancy wine bar and stuff. Um, let's see. So for those of you who uh, don't know who I am, I'm Nick Caldwell. Um, let's see. A couple things that I've been doing in the past. Most important one here is probably the one I'm most passionate about is actually the last one. It's Dev Color. I'm a board member there. That's an organization that's trying to get more people of color into technology. I spent a lot of time with that group. Yeah, there we go. Start there. Um, I spent uh, 15 years at Microsoft as a general manager for a product called Power BI, which I, I think, unfortunately, is currently the world's most um, popular BI product. What can you do? Uh, Reddit's all about monetizing cat pictures. Hopefully, you guys are uh, on that. <laughs> Couple of redditors in the room, and then uh, Looker, chief product officer. I've been there for about a year. I'm responsible for product engineering and design. This talk's going to be about like the initial challenge that I had uh, at Looker. I think it'll resonate with a lot of you folks. And then we just got acquired by Google for 2.6 billion dollars. Uh, I got a good chunk of that, enough to buy some new Jordans. So I'm looking forward for that deal closing. So uh, let's jump into what is Looker. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. We're a big company, 900 plus employees, growing like crazy. 5,000 what we call developers. Uh, our, our software is essentially uh, you use development tools to build a semantic model for all of your data. Uh, here, actually, I'll just visualize that. Um, connect to all your data. Put a semantic model on top of it that gives you a unified, governed way to access it. We call it the API for data. And then on top of that API, you can do all sorts of cool things. The boring, old-fashioned thing is classic business intelligence, but you can also do integrations into existing workflows and tons of new uh, custom applications. Um, from uh, everything from people automating their trucking fleets to automating their digital marketing spend. Uh, just imagine what you could do if you had an API that was connected to all of your data. Okay, let's move on. Now, uh, this is a quote from one of our uh, founders, Lloyd Tab, and he says, building great products is an act of empathy. And I think it's like a really cool um, quote um, because it speaks to uh, how, how you guys need to think about making the best pot possible product. Like think about what your users actually are trying to accomplish, what their pain points, uh, et cetera, are. The other important thing about empathy from a product management perspective is if you think about what your job really is, we just spent a whole bunch of time talking about like, um, you know, the best way to build like essentially an onboarding flow. But if you think about what product managers really do, they're really empathizing with all their stakeholders. Like some of those stakeholders are customers, some of those stakeholders are like your field, some of those stakeholders are your engineers, or your other PMs, et cetera, et cetera. You're trying to synthesize all of that stuff into some sort of coherent product roadmap. That's really what PMs spend the majority of their time doing. So the challenge that I faced uh, at Looker was when you boil it down, it was kind of a, a lack of this empathy. This empathy was broken. And let me tell you why. You guys ever seen this chart before? This is like the product lifecycle chart. It uh, tracks sales uh, and profits over the different maturity stages uh, of a particular product. Development, intro, growth, maturity, decline. Another way to think about this is what the product and engineering team needs to be doing, right? So I've kind of overlaid some, uh, some other labels on here. In the early phases of your project, you're trying to innovate because you don't have product market fit. You're not really sure what you're, if what you're building is the right thing. Once you know what you're supposed to be building, you have to shift into execution. And then much, much later, when your product has um, you know, saturated the market or is in decline, you go into maintenance mode. But it's real interesting what happens between these first two phases, innovation and execution, right? And this innovation phase, particularly at a startup, I don't know how many people in the room are all like at really small startups, but what you often see happen here in this innovation phase is you are really just hyper-connected with customers. I think Allison was talking about this earlier. Just You only got like 20 customers. Just experiment with them. So you can optimize really, really heavily for specific individuals. And what ends up happening is a combination of sales and engineering owning the product roadmap. Like I see this happen all the time at small, small scale startups. But when you get into this, you know, hey, uh, execution phase, you have, you know, thousands of customers. And you can't make your product roadmap the same way. You can't be chasing after individual customers. And as a product manager walking into this situation where uh, sales and engineering 
are running the roadmap, what are you supposed to do, all right? So this is my first 30 days at Looker. Extremely successful business, but as warned by the board, the CEO, everyone I talked to who warned me about what I was walking into, incredibly unreliable product roadmap, extreme mistrust from our customers in the field, C.1 unreliable product roadmap. We're shipping things loudest customer first. And then there was this culture that had been instituted by our founder, the guy I quoted earlier. The engineer has the pen. And what the engineer has the pen really means is, you know, the engineers are going to get to decide what we work on. Any ex-engineers in here? Like, by that is like kind of a cool superpower where you, at the end of the day, like you control what gets checked in. <laughs> and they're certainly taking advantage of that. So this is my first 30 days uh, trying to figure out how we're going to, to address this issue. And everyone was telling me this. I, I, could, I was going to put an individual, but literally it was everyone. I had board members telling me that this was a massive problem. Like there is just no trustworthiness in your roadmap. So. Uh, one way to look at this is what do you do when engineering and sales have taken control of the product? I choose not to look at it that way. Another way to look at it is how do we create confidence and partnership with the product team? All right, that's the optimistic way to look at this. Now, there's going to be uh, three steps I'll talk about and how, you, how I accomplish this at Looker. First one, winning over engineers. Step one. <laughs> So vision's not enough to deal with an engineer, particularly one who already like, thinks that they have the best uh, you know, ideas in mind for the product roadmap. So the way that you can kind of, if you find yourself in this situation, the way that you can kind of overcome the inertia, ask for technical reviews, spend time with architects and observe the de developer lifecycle. Another way to think about this though is in the same way that you would build empathy with a customer in the field, try and build empathy with your engineers on the floor. And that means don't show up and tell them about this awesome ass new vision that you're, you're going to bring to the team. They'll just tune you out. And they're already in charge. They don't have to listen to you. But empathizing with them builds trust. And with that trust, you can get them to listen to not just you, but to the customer ideally. So second thing, introduce the customer. On the right hand side uh, here is, um, uh, in, in the BI uh, industry, we have an industry analyst, Gartner, that you know, basically tells us if we're winning or not. And one thing I found um, within the first two weeks of working at Looker is that no engineer, and unfortunately even the PM team largely, there's a, one or two exceptions, but no one had really ever just stepped back from looking at the very narrow way in which we approach BI to thinking through like what does the entire industry do. So just bringing in outside opinions and industry analysts helped a lot. And again, going back to the product life cycle stuff I talked about earlier, in the very early phases of a product, you actually don't need this, right? You're building something very niche and very specific, all right? So you don't really need to think about what everyone else is doing. You need to think about how you're going to win in your particular niche. But as you scale up, you'll encounter larger customers who do care about this. And it's important as you scale up to introduce not just your PM team, but your engineers into the broader conversation. We also brought in guest speakers at All Hands to talk about their experience with the product. Uh, because engineers, a lot of times, they kind of can be locked in a basement. You know, don't, <laughs> you know throw pizza, pull up, open the door, throw a pizza down into the basement, code comes out, right? And then the final thing is uh, NPS and CSAT verbatims. Right, so one of the first things I did, I think this was like a month in when I realized uh, one of our PMs had access to an NPS database. I just picked through it and chose some of the choicest, most like concerning things I could find and then walked through those with the engineering uh, leaderships. And the, the point of this is to, to not beat yourself up and, and like make yourself feel bad. It's to try and teach the engineers that like they don't see everything, right? You know, engineers, like, I remember when I was an engineer, I thought you could just code your way to any possible solution, right? But you don't know what you don't know until someone lets you know. And this is a great way, in a very unbiased fashion, to bring third-party input into the conversation. Finally, once you've finally, like, broken their spirit on acknowledging that other people might have valid opinions, you have to also account for their needs, all right? So... Customers are complex, but engineers actually still have extremely valid contributions to the product roadmap. So what you have to do as a PM is make sure that you always account for technical debt as part of your product roadmap. Uh, try and account for customer happiness 
in some way, in the same way that you might account for customer happiness. So customer happiness, you're major, may, maybe you're measuring NPS or CSAT. Developers are gonna have productivity metrics you can measure as well. Like one that we're trying to hammer right now is time to check in, right? So if I'm a developer and I wanna check something in, when we started, it took like uh, I think an hour and a half, all right, from start to finish. And we were just chipping away at that to the point where I think this morning we announced it was like 25 minutes. And this, again, is all about engendering uh, trust with your engineers. The final thing, and is the most important in terms of engendering trust, as a PM, if you need to do time estimates, those need to come from the bottom up from the engineering team. All right? And w the thing that our team was most afraid of was that I would like show up and just start putting roadmap items on the board and forcing them to stay up till 2 a.m. every day until everything was done. Uh, and I said, no, over and over and over again, I said, you, we are only going to commit to the timeline what you, the engineering team, says is possible. And they don't believe you initially because engineers are naturally a skeptical, cynical bunch. But after you run through one quarter of this and they realize that, yeah, we did what I said, what the engineer, we did what the engineers said we could do, things turn out okay, and then you keep going. Right? So treat the engineers as a customer too. Second, once you got your engineers on board, you still got to win over the field. And if you've been running a team for five years with no product roadmap, there's a lot of damage that you're going to have to overcome. First one, install air vents. You got to have some way for all of that kind of pent up, uh, you know, I don't want to say anxiety. The pent up anger and frustration needs to come out. So we set up a meeting. It was a weekly meeting. It was called like the escalation. You can call it whatever you want, but really it's just for you to sit there and take shit from the field for a while, all right? And for the first three instances of this, it was literally me being screamed at by our customer support people, our product support people, the sales guys, both inside, outside, east and west, all took their turns, and I just absorbed it, right? Again, it's all about building empathy, because empathy will lead to trust. It also did another thing, because if you get everyone who's complaining about you into one room and let them all complain about you at the same time, then they start to feel pity for you. <laughs> it worked. So at the, end, at the end of the, some of these meetings, it was like, oh, wow, I didn't realize you had all these requests. No wonder mine wasn't getting done, right? Because you have like 300 other things that you're supposed to do. So install some air vents. This is really about frequent uh, time with other stakeholders. Just make sure those are on the calendar. Second is zone coverage. So in the initial model of like when you're just getting off the ground, I think the earlier presenter said this as well, like they're, they can have a one-to-one -one relationship with your customers. Your um, sales team often scales to a point where for a long time it can have a one-to-one -one relationship with customers until they end up having to, to split into regions. Um, you need to provide the same sort of support from a PM perspective. Um, as what your field is doing. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a, for every you know, field rep, you have to have a PM. That's not what I'm saying. But you need to have some way to understand and aggregate feedback from the field and what customers are experiencing. So the way that we did this was um, we assigned uh, individual PMs to all of our top, uh, I think it was our top 15 customers, something like that. And then we did zone defense amongst the, the rest of them split by size. You might also split by geography and so forth. And then as part of our planning process, we have each of those zones, uh, you know, every quarter come and give us feedback into our product roadmap. So in this way, a couple good things happen. One, you get more product roadmap input. But two, your sales team, which used to just put complaints into some, you know, amorphous bucket in Jira, like, you know, more, more and more feature requests, now has some peer on the PM team that they can go to if they need help. And that further reduces uh, complaints and builds trust. And then finally, roadmap. Nothing solves more problems in an organization than just having a roadmap, even if that roadmap is inaccurate. So I like to have something that is really, really accurate up to a three-month uh, time frame. Out to six months, you know, maybe you're 50% accurate. And you do need to go beyond six months purely because you will be asked by your CEO, the field will be asked by customers for all of these little features that you probably aren't even going to do, but need to be on the roadmap. <laughs> it quiets people down to know that you're at least thinking about their concerns for the future, right? So have a roadmap, get it out as quickly as possible. The other uh, thing I would suggest that you do when you're forming your roadmap, to go, going back to that field discussion we had earlier, 
you can build a lot of trust by talking to your sales engineering team or, or some of your product support field people and just stealing whatever their hottest ideas are and front loading them in your product roadmap. So if you need to build trust, there's so much low hanging fruit. If you just go ask the sales engineering team, like what are the top bugs, pick those up, knock them down right away, and then you can get back to the business of having a longer, uh, longer roadmap. And then finally, culture of execution. What I mean by this is um, in the early days, you have a culture of innovation. Right? You're trying to figure out like, what's the best way to meet customers' needs. You're going to try a lot of things. You're going to reward experimentation. All that's fun and, and dandy. But when you're in the growth phase, it's much more about you know what needs to get done and you need to execute. And execution, uh, while maybe not as fun, is much more important in this growth phase. So how do you build a culture of execution? First one is emphasize mission. You know, when you're talking about um, the discovery phase, I think you emphasize more vision. Like, what is this grand thing? Like, how would the world be better, you know, in five years if our company was successful? But that's not execution. Like, when you, when you want to emphasize execution, you have to shift mindset and talk about mission. And mission is a clear goal, how you're going to do it, and some, like, very, like, ideally very near-term time limit on that goal. Like, my favorite example of this is probably JFK. We're going to put a man on the moon in five years, right? And we're going to do it fast, and we're going to be smart. I forget exactly what he said, but, you know, you guys can look the JFK up quote <laughs> for yourself. But missions are about taking the hill within a particular time. It's not about flowery language. It's about we're going to do X, Y, and Z by next week. Um, and then you repeat these missions over and over and over to your team until there's clarity about what they need to be um, uh, doing day to day. Now, that doesn't mean vision goes away completely. It's just in your day to day, in your regular rhythm, primarily you need to be talking about mission and what people should be accomplishing in some uh, clear time frame. Second, rhythm of business. Um, you've gotta have uh, at every level in your organization a heartbeat. Right? Something that keeps the right set of people meeting together, discussing the, the uh, topics at the correct level. The most obvious version of this is like daily stand-ups that engineers use. You know? But if you think about it, this is totally transferable to every other level in your organization. Um, so managers can meet frequently, directors can meet frequently, our executive team meets uh, once a week. But the key thing is these meetings aren't meant to be fun. All right? Not every meeting is you're going to show up there and it's going to be a product launch and da 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 These meetings need to be like clockwork, and you need to talk about, you know, hey, what are you accomplishing? Did you, did you do what you said you're going to do? Is there anything I can do to unblock you? That same pattern you see at the daily stand-up translates to every level of the organization. Now, you may not do it daily. You may do it weekly, or some of these you may do quarterly, but every level of the uh, business needs to have this rhythm to it. All right? And finally, what do you reward? Start to reward shipping stuff on time with high quality. All right. You know, I, I think in an innovation phase, it's like you were, someone did a cool demo in their spare time and showed it off to the CEO, got a pat on the back. If you're trying to shift to an attitude where execution is more important, ship, reward delivering things on time or earlier at specified quality bars and talk about it that way. It doesn't mean you can't talk about cool, innovative things, but if you want to have a culture of execution, talk about meeting customers' needs and solving their problems, right? over and over and over. A cheat you can use to really drive this home into your culture, you all probably have hackathons, which I suspect by default are hugely oriented toward like do random you know, innovation projects or things like that. What we've done uh, at Looker is we still have the ability to do all sorts of innovation projects, but we've also inserted the idea that, hey, why don't we seed the hackathons with ideas that are related to quality or developer uh, eff effectiveness? And what we've seen is people like, are able to make really, really rapid progress on some of these fundamental uh, developer effectiveness uh, problems that have yielded our ability to then go and ship product much, much, much faster. And they feel really good about it. All right, so results. Let's talk about the good stuff here. Uh, we've had four quarters of this. We have shipped 700 epics. That is an 85% uh, completion rate for everything that we said we wanted to do for the year. This little animated GIF is a uh, everything that's in our Roadmonk Gantt chart, just to show all the stuff that we've been tracking over the year. So first official roadmap in seven years, paid off 
I, I believe, several years' worth of tech, tech debt. What you're seeing here is uh, Looker's, um, Looker 7's dashboards, which were completely written over the last uh, three quarters. Uh, every aspect of this is new. It's on React. The new we have new controls, new filters, et cetera. This is a problem that had been plaguing the business for, I think, about three years, according to our CEO, who complained to me about it all the time. And in addition to that, I know we talked a lot about execution. Turns out if you execute really well, you have more time for innovation. So uh, we were able to, in addition to everything that we said we were going to do at the beginning of the year, we did a whole mobile application on top of it. And finally, all that lines up to customer success. I won't read this whole quote, but things like this really make me happy because when we get our product out into the market, uh, it's not just making customers happy, but people like Nick Fogler have built their entire businesses on top of Looker. Uh, and that makes me really happy to see him uh, be successful as well. All right, now the other stuff, because that's all rosy. First, um, some lessons to learn. You want to spend time with supporters, not naysayers. I think when I walked into Looker the first week, I, you know, I spent maybe a little bit too, too much time trying to placate people who didn't want to move into this uh, kind of roadmap-driven world. And what I should have done is spend more time with supporters. Because it turns out there were a lot of people who recognized and saw all of these problems. And the great thing about spending your time with supporters is they then become your advocate throughout the organization. So it's not you selling stuff, it's your supporters going and pitching the stuff as well. Second, change aversion. People would rather use an old system known not to work than try something new. So you have to treat any sort of uh, change as uh, it's a product launch in and of itself. So an example of this is um, internally, we didn't have a roadmap, we didn't have JIRA, uh, and I thought to myself, oh, like installing Jira, how hard of a, a problem could it be? It's an, it's a, like, com compared to what we were using before, which was nothing, this has got to be vastly better. Well, it turns out, no, like, uh, that needed to be managed uh, just like any other uh, product we would roll out. And then finally, um, we talked about innovation and execution. You do have to figure out how to get the right balance. Like most of this talk has been about execution, but ultimately you have to have the right balance between execution and innovation. The blue flame is where you build the best products, where you have the right balance of execution along with kind of the artistry and magic that comes with good innovation. And because we didn't hit this balance early enough, we lost two of our best uh, engineers. Uh, they ended up, they were, I would say like kind of propeller head types, but they were working on some really cool stuff that now we actually need, and we're trying to reform that team. So if we had been a little bit more thoughtful about how to get that balance, we might have saved ourselves uh, some time. So with that, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, I think I have time for questions now. Yeah, I think we can do a little Q&A. First of all, thank you again, Nick. That oh, was great. Sure. <laughs>